I'm sure I'm not saying that right. Um, I think he was Russian, uh, just based on what I can tell about him. I had a student a few years ago who taught me how to say this name, but I forgot. Uh, I'm sure it's not Poliak, but we'll just call it Poliak. Poliak step sizes, um, they are a choice of step size that you can make when the optimal criterion value is known. So if you know F star, then this is, in a sense, the best step size that you can, uh, that you can take. And it, they, they're motivated just from the first step in the subgradient proof. So when you do your homework, the first step in the sub proof of the subgradient method is going to be expansion of this type. And um, if you look at this and you try to minimize the right-hand side to so make this bound as good as possible, you're going to derive that step size. So the step size at, at uh, step k is going to be uh, the criterion value of where you were at the previous iterate, iterate, f of xk minus 1, minus f star over the norm of the gradient square that you're choosing in order to get, um, you know, say, xk. So that, that's the choice of step size, polyac step sizes. You can show that the subgradient method with polyac step sizes still achieves the rate of 1 over epsilon squared. So even with this very favorable choice of step size, which is only possible when um, f star is known, you still only get a rate of 1 over epsilon squared. It doesn't change the rate, but it can, it can make a big difference in practice in terms of how fast the algorithm is converging. Um, OK, so you might object to this. You might look at this and say, well, this is ridiculous. Um, I'm trying to find the solution. I'm defining step sizes in terms of the solution. How is that realistic? Um, it's important to, to note this is not x star. It's just f star, right? So I'm not actually claiming I know anything about the solution. Just, I just know something about I'm claiming the optimal criterion value. And in some cases, that may be uh, a reasonable thing to assume. And this is an, a nice example of where that's reasonable. Um, this is a problem called intersection of sets. And the problem is very simple. Suppose I give you m closed convex sets, c1 through cm. And I ask you to find a point in their intersection. That's your, your task. Suppose, for example, that you're going to be running one of the fancy algorithms that we uh, learn later in the course with constraints. And you need to start from a feasible point. And that's the constraint set, C1 intersect CM. Then this might be something you run before you run your fancy interior point method or something, because you need a feasible point. You just need an x that's in the intersection of these sets to begin. OK, so this you can think of this as a, a pre-algorithm before the algorithm. Uh, for optimization. Or it can just be, this is the problem you want to solve. You want to find a point that's in, that's in the intersection of these sets. So we can actually define a, a convex optimization problem in order to find such a point. <laughs> and um, it's just going to use some of the, the basic facts we've learned so far about convexity. First, let's define for each set the distance function to that set and call that fi. So fi is the distance between a point x and a set ci. So that's going to be convex. right? That's a convex function. Um, we know that's convex because the distance function from x to a set, say, ci, is the minimum over all y in the set ci of y minus x squared. Or just you can just think of that as y minus x, actually, the norm. And remember, we learned that uh, if I do a partial minimization over a, a convex function, and I'm minimizing over a convex set, the result is still a convex function. So this is convex in y and x jointly at this function. It's just uh, the L2 norm composed in affine transformation. This set C you're told is convex, so the distance function is convex, a convex function of x. So each of these fi's are convex functions. Let's now define f to be the maximum of each of the fi's at a point x. So the pointwise maximum of convex functions, it's still convex. Okay, so f is a convex function as well. At any point x, it tells us uh, the distance, the farthest distance we are to any of the sets, c1 through cm. Now let's try to solve this problem. Okay, minimize over all x, f of x. If we know that those sets have a non-empty intersection, right? Presumably they do, otherwise we wouldn't be trying to find a point in the intersection then we know that the optimal value for this problem is, is 0. Right? f star is 0. At the solution, at any point that's in their intersection, f of x is going to be 0, because the distance to every one of the sets is going to be 0. 
So it's an example of a convex optimization problem. It's not differentiable necessarily. Right? You can see that in part because I have this maximum here. Um, also because I didn't tell you anything about the set CI. But um, no, actually, it's really because of this maximization. Let me take that back, that it's not smooth. Right? Because there can, there can be points, obviously, where you're equally close to more sets. And we've seen there that, in that case, uh, you know, the, the maximum, when there are more than one functions that achieve the maximum, has, has multiple subgradients. We've seen that in a previous lecture last time. So it's a convex optimization problem, non-smooth. Optimal criterion value is 0. So we can try to use subgrading method with the Poliak choice of step size, or this choice of step size. Um, let's just first build our way there to see what that algorithm is going to look like. Um, recall from last time, I went through this very quickly. Um, this is really just an exercise in subgradients. Uh, you know, so if, if this is something that you were confused about, then come to my office hours. I'm happy to go through that in more detail. It's just a, a demonstration of how we use subgradients to prove some facts. This is the fact that I, I cited and went through very quickly last time, which is that the distance function to any set is, well, we, we already know it's convex. But I'm actually claiming here that it's, uh, it's differentiable. And this is its gradient. So last time, we actually wrote down a subgradient of the function. And that was this thing. And I also just said in passing it was the only subgradient, which meant that it was differentiable. Okay, So at any point x, the gradient is going to be x minus its projection onto the set c divided by the norm. And the projection onto c, is, it is the, it's the argument here. It's the y that achieves the minimum. Okay, um, So that was something we knew from last time. Also from last time, we know that there's a subgradient rule for maxima of functions. Right? If I take a pointwise maximum of functions, max of, of uh, fi of x, i going from 1 through m, then the subgradient of the resulting function, f at x, is given by looking at all the functions that are active at x, which means they achieve the maximum. So all the functions i for which fi, fi of x is equal to f of x, taking their subgradients and taking a convex hull of that whole set. So for example, if two functions were active and they only, they're differentiable, so they only had gradients, then this, the sub, set of subgradients would be anything on the line segment joining their two gradients. That was a simple case we also saw last time. Okay, so in other words, if I have a function that achieves the maximum and I have a subgradient of that function, then that subgradient is a valid subgradient of f. That's a rule we can remember. Okay, because for applying the subgradient method, we just need a subgradient of the criterion. You don't need every subgradient of the criterion, right? We just need to pick one. And so this is a valid one from this rule. For us, actually, these fi's, they're going to be the distance functions, right? And they're differentiable. So this is just going to be their gradient. GI is just going to be that quantity up there, their gradient. So just piecing together the stuff we've learned over the last couple of lectures. OK, so I, I just said that out loud, but there's it written down. Um, if you ever add a point x, which is farthest to the set ci among all the other sets, then that fi of x, which is the distance function, it's going to achieve the maximum here. right? So according to this rule, I can just take one of its subgradients. And since it's differentiable, that there's only one such quantity I can take, which is its gradient. And I can use that as a subgradient of my criterion f. So I can move in this, the negative direction of this vector for subgradient method. OK, so um, the Polyak step size, another thing to note, just reduces to choosing the criterion value at the last iteration. That's because the optimal criterion value is 0 here. And this, all the subgradients we're picking have norm 1. You can see that right here. Right? All these subgradients that we're ever going to pick have norm 1. So the Polyak step size is just the criterion value at the last iteration. That's going to be the step sizes we pick. So let's just literally write out um, the subgradient steps with all of these choices. At the point uh, xk minus 1, I first find the set c that's farthest from xk minus 1. Call that ci. Uh, 
And then I, up, I update xk minus 1 according to this rule. Take xk minus 1, subtract off the step size, which was, remember, f of xk minus 1 according to the Polyak rule, times any valid subgradient of the function f at xk minus 1. We're going to choose this one because it happened to be the gradient of fi of x at xk minus 1. So it's x minus its projection onto the set ci divided by the norm of that. And uh, just right. all we have to do now is recognize that um, f of xk minus 1 is equal to xk minus 1 minus the projection onto ci of xk minus 1. That's because, just draw yourself a picture, right? Actually, that has to be convex. But I told you ahead of time that the set that was farthest to xk minus 1 was going to be this set, say ci. And that means that the, the criterion value, which is the maximum of the distance to all functions, is just going to be the distance it is to ci just by definition of ci. So that's the criterion value at the point xk minus 1. OK, so just plug that in on the slide here. Cancels the denominator. See, the xk minus 1 cancels with xk minus 1. All I get is, a, is a, for xk is the projection onto the set ci of xk minus 1. So what have I done with the subgrading method? All I've done is I've identified the set that's farthest from my current point. And for my next point, I've projected my, my point x onto that set. That's the subgradient method. This is actually the alternating projections algorithm, okay? or, or multiple alternating projections algorithm if you have more than one set. So with just with two sets, all I'm doing is I'm just projecting back and forth between the sets. So it's probably the algorithm you would have come up with had somebody given you this problem from first principles. Right? It's a very natural, very natural way to approach this problem. Um, and with more than one set, right, you're just always projecting to the farthest set. That's all you're doing. I think it's pretty cool the subgradient method comes down to this because you can see a couple of things. The first thing you can see is that this converges, right? This converges. We wouldn't have known that had we not had the subgradient method. Proving this converges from first principles would have been maybe tricky. Right? You might have tried to try something geometric. But this is just a special case of the subgradient method. So it converges, and in fact, we know its rate. It's going to converge at the rate 1 over epsilon squared. So what does that mean in terms of this problem? What, is, what does it mean to be within 1 over epsilon squared of the criterion value? So they can, right, what geometrically does that mean? Right, it means I can basically, let's say I just draw like a tube around each of these point, uh, each of these sets. All the sets in my collection of uh, diameter epsilon. Then it means that I wanna, if I want to get in that tube, I need about 1 over epsilon squared projections to get in that tube. OK, was there a question? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer. Um, I'm guessing it wouldn't converge. Yeah. It seems like you're going to get closer and closer to a free full point, but it, your final solution is never Right. Good. Also a very good point. So just to repeat that, if you wanted to actually get a point in the intersection of sets, you wouldn't with a subgradient method or with this algorithm, right? You just get a point that's very close to it within this tube. So the kind of cheap hack people do is that often these are defined in terms of inequalities of functions or something. So it's very easy to blow them up. So initially, I just blew up the sets by some amount, like a tiny, like multiply all the constraints by like 1.001 or something. And then I will get within some tube of that, so I'll, I'll land the original sets when I, uh, when I, at some point in the algorithm. So for, for that to work, you have to know how to kind of inflate the, the sets easily. But often, if these come from like a functional inequality, like if this guy is defined by g i of x is you know, less than or equal to like b i or something, then you know how to do that. So yeah, very good question. 
Any other questions? No? OK. Um, so we have about 20 minutes to talk about stochastic methods, which um, I think are a very important topic nowadays. And as I said, we'll spend more time on this. So I plan to spend more time on this at the end of the semester, so you'll see more details then. Um, stochastic methods, also called incremental methods, they are born out of the following um, idea, what happens if you're trying to minimize a very large sum of functions? Well, you're going to see that if you're minimizing a very large sum of functions, so if minimizing the sum of fi of x from i going from 1 through m, then computing the, say, subgradient or even the gradient at x is going to involve a very large sum, right? Because both of those operators, the subgradient operator and the Grain operator or additive, so I have to just take a you know subgradient of each fi or gradient of each fi if they're differentiable and, and sum it up. So that can be very expensive. Um, that's the that's the setting basically for stochastic methods. When would I see this, by the way, in practice? When would I see like a very large sum of functions I'm minimizing? What's some examples? Yeah, anything. Yeah, right. SVM, really any classification or regression method with a lot of samples. So here's, here's an example we saw in the, in the lecture, logistic regression. Okay, I could also have done SVM here. Um, and there's another, another way of doing classification. But n is the number of training points I have. You can see that the function I'm minimizing is a sum of n functions. And what happens if n was a billion? If I had a billion training points I'm trying to build a classifier for? That means every time I try to compute a subgradient or gradient, I have to sum a billion things. It's not exactly very practical, right? Maybe a billion's too small. You guys aren't impressed. So pick a bit, pick a number larger than a billion, and convince yourself that that's not easy to do. Um, so that's the subgradient update, right? I sum up all the subgradients for each of the functions fi and call those gi. The subgradient, the idea behind the, sub, the stochastic subgradient method, are really um, stochastic gradient methods when they're smooth is just to say, let's just pick an arbitrary one of those. Pick one at random. Pick i, k to be uniformly distributed, say, between 1 through m. And instead of moving the direction of the sum of the gi's, just move in the direction of g i, k. So I might pick like the 11th function and move in the direction of its subgradient or negative subgradient. And the next iteration, I might pick the 107th function and move in the direction of its negative subgradient, etc. OK, so this ik is some index chosen between 1 through m at iteration k. Um, and I, I just said verbally that we would choose it randomly, uniformly at random. That's probably the most common choice. Just digest that for a second. OK, stochastic gradient descent is a special case when, of course, these functions are differentiable, so the subgradients are just the gradients. So you might hear the word stochastic gradient descent, SGD, more often than stochastic subgradient method. But, uh, but of course, by talking about stochastic subgradient method, we're including that, that case as well. So there are two rules that are probably the most common for choosing the index ik at iteration k. There's the randomized rule, which is the one I just said. Choose ik uniformly at random between 1 through m at every step. There's also a cyclic rule, which has us kind of proceeding more in a more um, carefully prescribed order through the indices so that we manage to hit every function eventually. And that's just we're going to choose ik to be, say, 1 through m, 1 through m, 1 through m across iterations. Or you could take a permutation of 1 through m and visit it in that order, and then a new permutation visit in that order, a new permutation visit in that order, et cetera. But the, the difference being that uh, here, you're making sure that you visit um, an index at least every uh, 2m iterations. Right? I'm going to at least visit every index you know, at some regular intervals. Oops. So I think the randomized rule is by far more common in practice. I don't think people really implement the cyclic rule very often. Um, there's another variant which is called a mini-batch stochastic gradient method or mini-batch stochastic gradient descent. 
for differentiable functions. And that's what happens when instead of taking just a single ik, I take a, subs a subset of the m, and I sum up over those instead. OK, so it's, this, is a, this is a special case of the mini-batch stochastic subgradient with the batch size of 1. So you can take a bigger batch size. Um, that's often helpful in practice, although this, these next few slides, I'm just going to be talking about pure stochastic methods. So the, the, you're only ever picking one function whose subgradient you're going to follow. Um, what's the difference between stochastic methods and the usual, uh, usual subgradient method, which is often called batch? So we, we refer to, in, in this lingo, for this uh, literature, we refer to the usual subgradient method or usual gradient sign as batch, the batch method. Um, computationally, if you take m stochastic steps, right, you've really equated yourself with one batch step. Right, because compute, you're computing m gradients. Let's, let's just stick with gradient descent for now. I've computed m gradients, and I've actually added m gradients to my iterates. So it's kind of computationally equivalent to just taking a full gradient update where these are all gradients. So after m steps, you have about the same as, um, as one batch step. Uh, what about progress? What about the progress we make? Are they comparable in terms of progress? So before that, let's actually convince ourselves that there's something else going on that, that makes the stochastic methods useful. So even if computationally m batch steps, m stochastic steps is kind of equivalent to one batch step, why might it be um, practically favorable to take m stochastic steps rather than a full batch step? Forget about progress, how fast it's converging. Just think about a practical reason. Yeah? Yeah, so that, that's, that's interesting. So you're talking about the progress, like how we'd be converging. Um, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. But um, practically, why might it make your life easier if you, were, if you had a data set, let's say, of size 100 trillion that you were trying to, you're trying to minimize you know, ridge logistic regression over 100 trillion training samples? Why would a batch step be infeasible? What are you going to hit before computational? Memory, right, memory. It's having, you have to have all that in memory, right, in order to form uh, the batch estimate. Stochastic methods, you, just, you can just have it, you can pull in basically a training sample into memory when you want to take a step. So somewhat beyond what we're going to be talking about in this course, and certainly beyond the size of the homeworks you're going to be um, solving, but you know, it actually makes a big difference in practice in terms of memory usage. So let's talk about progress. Um, this is just going to be a very high level um, walkthrough of the kind of progress you'd expect to see from using uh, the cyclic rule, just for simplicity, because it's simpler to think about, with smooth functions. So you're doing stochastic gradient descent with, with uh, cyclic updates. After m steps, which we will call one cycle, if let's just assume all the step sizes between uh, you know, iterations k plus 1 and k plus m were, were constants, they were just uh, t then this is the update we're going to see. Right, we're going to see xk plus m to be xk minus the, uh, the sum of the gradients at all of the points we've seen in between, all the iterates in between. One full batch step, which is kind of computationally equivalent, is going to be this instead. Right? We're going to take the point xk, we're going to subtract off our step size, and move in the direction of the sum of the gradients across all the functions. The difference here is where we're evaluating them. Okay, we're evaluating them at, uh, at xk in the batch step. But as was just mentioned uh, you know, a few minutes ago, each of these functions are actually being evaluated at different iterates after m stochastic steps. So you can think about this in a couple of ways. The first is that, well, I can think about actually one, one cycle of stochastic gradient descent as a perturbed version of gradient descent. I meant to move in the direction of the gradient. I meant to move in this direction. But I moved in that direction instead. And their difference is this. This is the error I, I am 
kind of uh, witnessing when I'm moving in, in some direction. It's the perturbation of the gradient. So I meant to move in the direction of the gradient. I moved in the direction of the gradient plus this error instead. And you could see how you might now prove that the stochastic uh, method converged. You would just try to show that this error gets quite small across steps of the algorithm. You're, you're moving mostly in the direction of the gradient. This error is not too large. How would you do that? How would you bound this difference, for example? using a condition that we had seen already with gradient descent. So if the gradient is Lipschitz, then I can bound this in terms of the difference between iterates. Right? So that's, that's a good place to start already. So I just replace this by you know, Li times the norm of the difference between the iterates. Um, so we can believe that the stochastic method should converge if the gradient isn't very wildly in x. Right? If the gradient was very wild in x, so say it wasn't Lipschitz continuous, or it was Lipschitz continuous with a huge constant. And this might be a, a very big perturbation. So it might not converge. On the other hand, there's some intuition here, let's just mention, which is that we're actually updating our gradient evaluations at a kind of fresher point each time with stochastic methods. So this actually may help us converge faster, especially early on in the algorithm, when there's a big difference between where, the, um, where xk and xk plus 1 were. So I'm just going to tell you, let's see, right, I have just a few slides here. I'm just going to tell you the results for the convergence rates of, of stochastic methods. And I gave a reference in the, uh, at the end of the slides to where these are proved. It's like a review paper that has a nice kind of thorough treatment of all of this. Um, there's basically, for, for example, for subgradient, for a yeah, subgradient method, then you can derive results that are almost exactly analogous to what you saw for the subgradient method when applied in batch mode to a single function. And our setup is going to be um, each of those fi's is itself Lipschitz continuous with a constant g, and they have the, the same Lipschitz constant, and they're convex. So um, the result is that if you take fixed step sizes t, and you use either the cyclic or the randomized rules, either one produces the same, same bounds here, then the limiting criterion value you're going to see is f star plus 5 m squared g squared t over 2. Now, it's important to remember that here, m squared g squared, that serves as a Lipschitz bound for f, which is the sum of the functions fi. So if, if each of these are Lipschitz with constant g, then their sum is going to be Lipschitz with constant um, mg. So this is really on the same scale as what you saw before. Okay? So this is f star plus, well, we have a 5 here, but 5 times the Lipschitz constant squared times t over 2. For diminishing step sizes, both of those methods have a limiting criterion value that's optimal. So basically, you can convince yourself, or you, you can take a look at these, uh, the proofs in, in this paper and convince yourself that actually there's not much going on here besides the analysis of the subgradient method. It's just that you have to kind of look at the updates a little carefully when you talk about these uh, cyclic and randomized rules. Perhaps more interesting is the rate. This is where things get really interesting. And this is a, a big topic of research currently, although the, the methods that people study are a little bit more complicated than the ones that I, I put on the slides. Um, we saw that it has the same convergence properties. How fast does it get there? So the, the batch subgradient method, remember, had a rate of, if you look back at the slides, there's actually the Lipschitz constant squared over epsilon squared. So it's important to remember the Lipschitz constant here. Because in the order of whatever the Lipschitz constant squared was over epsilon squared to get an epsilon suboptimal solution. And I'm writing it as g batch to emphasize that's the Lipschitz constant for the whole function. That's if we applied the batch method to the whole to the subgradient method to the whole function. Here are the results um, in terms of convergence rates for the two rules. The cyclic rule has iteration complexity m cubed g squared over epsilon squared. That means that's how many iterations you need in order to get an epsilon suboptimal solution. So if I ask how many cycles I need, which is remember one cycle is equivalent to one batch step, I divide this by m and I get order m squared g squared over epsilon squared. So no different in terms of rate from 
uh, the batch method. However, the randomized rule, this is, I think, really remarkable, and it's, it's a, you know, part of the reason why people use them so much today, is that the iteration complexity is actually only order m squared g squared over epsilon squared. So if I think about how many cycles I need, and I divide that by epsilon, it's m g squared over epsilon squared. So it's actually reduced by a whole factor of m, its convergence rate, compared to the usual subgrading method. And that can be a huge difference if m is large. Now, there's a lot of details I'm leaving out here, like this actually holds an expectation for the randomized rule. It's a random algorithm. This is, this is the expected number of iterations that it requires. If you want a, like a thorough treatment, look at the review paper. This is just the, the high-level picture okay, in terms of convergence rates. Let me just give you, um, let me give you the classic subgradient method, uh, classic picture, and then, and then we'll, we'll end. So here's an example. I applied it to the same problem setup basically as I had before. Logistic regression. Um, I actually didn't have any penalties here. I just wanted to show you what it looked like to do logistic regression. So each of these functions is I'm calling fi of beta. And I want to minimize presumably a large sum of these functions. And the gradient computation involves the sum over the training samples of yi minus the predicted um, probability times xi. And you know, think about n being really, really big. It's maybe not very computationally feasible. So we do stochastic updates instead. And here's what happened in my, in my, uh, my example. Actually, I had, I had p to be equal to 2, so I can show you uh, what happened in terms of the contours. n was pretty large here, but p was equal to 2. Um, I'm tracking the conversions of the batch gradient descent rule versus the stochastic gradient descent rule in blue versus red. And uh, I'm actually, right, I'm showing each stochastic step here as a red dot, and each, and each batch step as a, as a blue dot. And this is really the classic picture you're going to see. Stochastic methods, they really thrive far from optimum. They, they make great progress early on. And especially the randomized rule, we, kind of say, we can say provably it converts a lot faster than the batch methods. But they have a really tough time once they get close to optimum. Okay, they're actually, they're kind of using the wrong gradient information there, right? They're updating, they're evaluating the gradient at the wrong spot. That's really what's hurting them. They can't converge to optimum very well. So, you know, what you'll see in practice is that you do very well early on, and then you bounce around the minimizer maybe indefinitely with the stochastic method, whereas the batch method will get you closer and closer with the right step sizes. Um, we'll talk about them much more later in the course, uh, and you'll get a better sense for them then. Okay, um, see you guys on...